I am the wrong hero, and you see here my minion toiling on my behalf. We're about to bring you a very special episode of Cafe Cabaret. It is the uh, the end of it's number 16 in a series of 24. So that means that we're officially two thirds of the way of a projected 24 part series on politics in the United States, bearing specifically upon the presidential election of 1996 and its aftermath. Now, you might think that it was about the most boring presidential election since, oh, 1984. At least, uh, in 1984, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't think Mondale had much of a chance either. And uh, I guess this time, though, the shoe was on the other foot in 1996. And what we witnessed was the eclipse of the Republican Party, hence the title of this presentation, Eclipse which is also called Eclipse because of some of the visuals we will be presenting in the minutes to come. So anyhow, let's talk a little bit about Confucianism. There was that big scandal with Vice President Gore um, doing all that Confucianism stuff, getting those monks, shaking those monks down, and so forth. Also, we must not fail to mention, before we begin, the DC Comics hero villain, Eclipso. Sort of like a poor man's Hulk. I mean, you know, a scientist by day, but whenever there's a moon uh, in Eclipse, then he becomes Eclipso, the evil, super-powered, uh, mad scientist uh, villain. And uh, the thing is, though, you know, you, you would think that eclipses are relatively rare, but they really began stretching it. First it was, well, whenever there's an eclipse anywhere in the world, whether it be a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse or the transit of Venus uh, or any of that crap. And then I think they even uh, got to the point where, well, if you made an eclipse in a room with a light source and something to cover it, then that would trigger the transformation into eclipse it was a pretty interesting idea, but they didn't do an awful lot with it. As I said, it was kind of like a poor man's Hulk. Anyhow, Joe Klein, who of course was later revealed as the anonymous author of Primary Colors, stated that the chasm between sensibilities, between the American desire for the appearance of action and the Chinese obsession with the appearance of order, is the conundrum at the heart of Sino-American relations. Now, Al Gore has always seemed a natural-born Confucian. Now, there's a movie title for you, Natural Born Confucians. Respectful of his elders, deferential to his superiors, ever loyal, a perfect protege, Gore's tendency to err on the side of starched propriety is the personal quality that served his China mission well. This is back when Al Gore went to China, which I guess was sometime in God knows when, sometime in April, I suppose, or late March. Rigor mortis was his portfolio, says Joe Klein of Al Gore. Words to remember when he does Primary Colors Part 2, The Race to 2000. But of course he won't be able to do it pseudonymously. I'm afraid we got right in the middle of a New Yorker from uh, April 7th for these citations. The Confucian ethic, and, and pay attention because this is stuff that uh, is well worth knowing, transforms etiquette into theology. Your worth as a person is determined by your public actions. The deference you demonstrate toward your parents and ancestors, of course, but also for a highly stylized system of rituals and ceremonies. The way you greet a stranger, speak, write, sip a cup of tea, or bolt down a jar of corn mash whiskey, for that matter. Um, and let me digress here. I saw this uh, BBC sitcom about a male secretary. A shocking notion in these days of, uh, of great American turmoil. Gee, I sure hope this isn't copyrighted material here. Um, I can't rightfully tell. I have a feeling that it may be. Oh, maybe not. It doesn't look like network quality stuff. I mean, I hate to say Oh, wait a minute. Special effects. Yeah, I think this is a uh, local cable access production. In which case, I don't think they'll mind too much me 
recording over it. Um, they wouldn't have left it at the station if they did. Anyhow, uh, take a letter of Mr. Smith, and of course, uh, he's like uh, this fat totem for this high-powered, brassy, Amazonian-type uh, woman who uh, runs this joint, Eight Star Productions. And, uh, and the episode I happened to catch, which I'd never seen before, I'd never seen this show before, um, a big, boozing, brawling, lusty Australian, the other, as opposed, of course, to the effeminate, tweedy, and uh, oh so um, propriety seeking um, British Anglo Saxon types that he was intended to be set against as a fish out of water, which is the classic sitcom plot. Well, the Australian guy takes it into his head that he's going to drink all the best whiskey and, and uh, make it with the uh, proprietress of Eight Star Productions or whatever the hell it's called. But she uses uh, her loyal secretary as a sort of Judas goat and implies to the Australian that since she is involved with him, she can't be involved with the lusty Australian. Now, it could have been an American, you know, but I guess they didn't want to uh, get into that. Australians are sort of like the exotic good other, and the Americans, well, they're a little too much, uh, uh, too much of a mongrel type of uh, situation there. I mean, Oh, and also they had this Italian nanny who was tending to the uh, high-powered executrix's daughter, who was like this hysterical, fat Italian woman who was constantly like ejaculating things like, "Oh, mamma mia, you know, don't touch her. You'll make, you'll, you'll mess up her dress and stuff, all this stuff." Really demeaning ethnic stereotype, but no more demeaning than the ethnic stereotype of the tweedy, effeminate Brit. So I guess it was okay. Anyhow. The Confucian ethic, the appearance of respect, which usually translates into a preternatural public placidity, is the threshold quality necessary for diplomatic success with the Chinese, according to Joe Klein. Grandstanding, indeed, almost any sort of spontaneity, is a sure sign of disrespect, a demonstration of weakness and a lack of discipline. And you can just see the Chinese warlords off plotting in their sinister mountain fortress top. The American dogs, they have no respect for tradition. They will easily be crushed. But anyway, informality, indeed a hint of rowdiness, is as deeply prized by the American electorate as it is scorned by the government of China. So in spite of its geographical location, the whole point is Australia is more like America than China will ever be. George Bush had the advantage of running against Dukakis who appeared even more vice presidential than he did. Now there's an idea. Why not make Dukakis the vice president to Al Gore? You know, he was shafted in 88. Anyway, in Confucian China, to embody the status quo was the ultimate state of grace, a sign of total immersion in the sacred rituals. In American politics, it just means that you're a fat target. Well, that's awfully nice. It's awfully nice of Joe Klein to offer us the benefit of his infinite and deep wisdom. Well, in the New Statesman from 21st March 1997, Tony Blair, recently elected as Prime Minister, although at the time he said this he hadn't yet been elected, said, I don't believe the polls. The Tories are like ferrets in a sack, but they won't give up the keys to Downing Street without a fight. Well, that's pretty stirring words from a man who knew that he had his victory in the bag against the Yes, Vice Presidential, uh, John Major. You know, it took me a second to think of his name. I almost forgot the name of John Major. Can you imagine that? I guess I won't be working for Whitaker's Almanac anytime soon. Whitaker's Almanac is really nifty. If you want the truly Anglo-centric Anglo viewpoint, you got to go to your local large public library or modestly large academic library and look up Whitaker's Almanac, in which... Um, it's arranged from the greater to the lesser in every respect, so that the hierarchy goes something like sun, moon, earth, planets, royal family. And then, of course, the royal family has infinite um, sort of degrees of royalty involved in their uh, hierarchy. So, uh, anyhow, switching subjects just about as rapidly as conceivably possible. Um, Go now to Abby Hoffman, who was in the news. Abby
Charlie Hoffman was a self-indulgent little smartass who made a modest contribution to freedom of expression in an era of secrecy, paranoia, and militaristic social organization. He displayed a journalist's instinct for anticipating the next event and then placing himself on the scene. But he confused his arrival with causation. Once there, he would seize the spotlight by providing large dollops of cheap entertainment. But when he later saw himself on television, he misinterpreted his airtime as confirmation of his power and influence. And speaking of arrogance and power, according to the American Journalism Review of April 97, when it comes to arrogance and power, the only people who make lawyers look good are journalists. And speaking of Nixon and that whole era that Abby Hoffman was involved with, Nixon took a hands-on, detail-oriented approach to tormenting people he disliked, says Ken Hughes. Well, it just goes to show. What it goes to show, I don't know. What it is, I'm not entirely sure. So let us pass over what we cannot explicate. In the New Republic of March 17th, which I missed, you know, for two weeks, to kind of, uh, see, the thing is, my coverage of these journals are as complete as they can possibly be, but sometimes I miss an issue which doesn't come in. And my source, of course, for all this is the John F. Kennedy School of Government Library in Harvard Square, where I work part-time, although perhaps not much longer if they get wind of this. Um, anyhow, I, I sort of more or less rely on them. Gee, what is this stuff? It doesn't look like uh, cable access type material to me. It looks pretty darn professional. Well, I can't worry about that now. Um, See, if there was some way I could alter this footage, then I would. Well, don't worry. Pretty soon we'll have the, the lunar eclipse to look at, and that certainly can't be copyrighted. Anyway, according to the New Republic, Bill Clinton's laws of politics. When you're starting to have a good time, you're supposed to be somewhere else. When someone says it's not the money, it's always the money. And nearly everyone will lie to you, given the right circumstances, according to Michael Kelly. And Hannah Rosen chimes in with this opinion. There are always signs that a reign is ending, and they are usually spotted not in the king himself, but in his court. In the inner circle, latent jealousies between advisors spill into open conflict as they angrily debate who is to blame for the calamity, chewing over each other's past errors and pointing the finger at old and nascent enemies. Next, the parliament crumbles. The ingrained habits of reverence toward the great one, the averted eyes, the bowed head, the devotion to every word as received truth, break down. The subjects no longer regard the king as divine. They begin to speak of him as if he is all too human. One of them, perhaps not even much of an example of one of them. They hang on his every word for an altogether different reason now. To spot the next stumble, record the growing list of regal follies and delusions. Among the strongest, a naked ambition blazes, a wish unseemly in its desire to succeed the dying one a wish barely tempered by lingering loyalty. Hopeful scheme, cabal's form. Amid all this, the king himself is absent, retreated to some protective space, some refuge in his mind. In Newt Gingrich, all the signs are there. Prescient words indeed, for a mere three months after she wrote this, that in fact did in fact become the case. What were once seen as the telltale marks of an erratic genius, the speaker's occasional bursting into tears, his open hydrant of millennial gushings, his flirtations with cuddly animals, are now increasingly and increasingly openly seen as the symptoms of a corrupted mind. He used to have grand visions, said one dispirited colleague. Now all he has is ranting and raving, vacuum tubes and ice buckets and squealing pigs. Even among the speaker's earnest supporters, all they can come up with is the language of recovery. It's fair to say that even among his supporters, 
The feeling is he has no margin of error. He has been told to smile more and use the phrase fun. We're having fun whenever possible. He also has been instructed to show his profile to the camera whenever possible, since it makes him look gentler. Everyone's being intensely loyal, but if the shoe drops, they're ready to shove him out the door. The subjects wonder, has the king lost control of his own destiny? Joe Gaylord, Gingrich advisor, makes it impossible for someone who disagrees with him to get on Newt's schedule. Any decision where Joe has an opinion, he will make sure a conflicting opinion does not get aired in front of Newt. It is a function of Joe's personality. He cannot tolerate conflict. He literally clams up. He freezes. It's like this panic symptom. You get the sense he wants to run. Pollsters, according to Hannah Rosen, are the least creative people in the world. Joe systematically advances the traditional Republican clique of advisors. It's one thing for Newt to have an ambassador to that world, but quite another for the world to come to dominate him. We wanted very much more from Newt. We wanted him to lead not just a party, but a revolution. The endless campaign mindset brings out the frenzied, mean side of Gingrich. Once the visionaries think the king has taken to waltzing in his nightshirt, it's hard to feel the old, odd way about him again. I guess you could call it the madness of King Newt, if you wanted to uh, take the metaphor a little further. In fact, I think that might have even been the title of uh, that particular piece. See, I don't get titles and page numbers. However, that was the New Republic from March 17th. So actually, she was a good four months on the ball because uh, they have a lead time of at least a week. The frightening collusion between the mainstream media and our intelligence apparatus, says the humanist of March, April, 1997. I've given up reading the humanist. I just don't have the time to read everything. Um, but I might have to take it up again. Oliver Stone says, in the Humanist of September, October 1996, excuse me, we have fascism now. We don't call it that, but that's what you get when corporations own governments. The only democracy that the American people are left with is the choice between fab or tie, ABC, CBS, and NBC. Turn the channel to your favorite show, access more cable channels, but it's basically only a consumer choice. It's merely a comfort zone, and if you're comfortable, there's no revolution, not even much evolution. But everywhere I go, I see people who are responsible and who care and who are involved in the good fight somewhere in this world. Ah, uh, isn't that touching? Well, citing from the humanist of January, 19, February 1996, if men are so well off, why is it that the, in the United States, 80 to 100% of those holding 25 of the 26 worst jobs are men? 94% of those killed on the job are men. Men are three times as likely as women to be alcoholics, and 50% more likely to use illegal drugs. Over 90% of our prison population is male. 85% of the homeless are men. Males commit suicide at a rate four times greater than the rate for females. Over the centuries, only males, often as young as 13, have been enslaved by the military, forced into combat, and slaughtered by the millions. And finally, if men are so well off, why is it that for every man who was woman who was murdered, three men are murdered? Probably because they were all fighting over that woman. Anyway. <laughs> uh, You see, things were, uh, well, maybe I should start reading The Humanist again. Maybe I should add it to my list because I got quite a lot of in interesting data. Most of it, of course, is for another presentation and not strictly political in advance, so I will not, in fact, go over it at this time. But, uh, you see, this is, this is where I got in this jag of reading History Today and uh, The Humanist figured I'd add to my already intolerable burden of reading materials. I mean, you know, I, this is crazy. I mean, I'm reading, what, 20, 30 journals a week. Um, 
and I don't know if it's entirely sustainable. By the way, did you know that napalm was invented at Harvard? Just another little thing that, to add to Harvard's list of distinguished inventions. And did you know that the Boy Scouts, according to the same issue of The Humanist of September, October 1995, are a federally protected monopoly and that since 1951, local councils have received donations of surplus military goods? Well, you know, that's something to keep in mind. And here's an interesting little uh, quote from History Today of January 1997. For every evil under the sun, there is a remedy or there is none. If there be one, try and find it. If there be none, never mind it. So basically, this invalidates this entire project that I'm currently engaged in being uh, so wrapped up in, this politics thing. Well, again, quoting from the January-February 1997 issue of The Humanist, Ludicra exercitatio facilis est, res civilis difficult. Difficilis. Difficilis. Boy, i got to brush up on my Latin pronunciation. When I learned Latin, I was at a boarding school run by Benedictine monks. And uh, so, of course, I used the church pronunciation when, in fact, a modified form of Italian pronunciation would quite possibly be more appropriate. Let me try that again. Ludicra exercitatio facilis est, res civilis, difficilis. Athletics is simple, politics complex. Of course, you know, that ties in with my old saying that politics is sports for people who are too fat to run. Anyhow, homo in speculo interroga. The person in the mirror has a question. When the media says, in effect, we are saying or asking these provocative things because it is our job to think of hot-button questions, when news interviewers attribute to the public a preoccupation with something that the media themselves are keen on because they hope it will generate a marketable amount of public interest, answer, I haven't heard anyone except you guys say or ask that. Exactly who are you quoting, anyway? Well, again citing Stephen Doloff in a very interesting article in the January-February issue of The Humanist from 1997, Verbum unum mille argumenta tionibus aequiparat. One word is worth a thousand arguments. One emotionally charged word or phrase repeated to create an irrational gut response is worth any amount of argumentation. I guess that Latin did come in handy after all. Well, again, on this Jefferson kick, which was uh, which showed up on the radar screen in the New York Review of Books of April 24th, Jefferson, the serene philosopher of having your cake and eating it, according to Eric L. McKittrick. In the written medium, Thomas Jefferson was the most accomplished rhetorician of his time handy thing to have when there was no mass media, a rhetorician who was the most accomplished in all written media. Jefferson's denial, the kind of duplicity possible only in the pure of heart. Now it's a pity about that book, Mason and Dixon. Jefferson didn't make an appearance. Of course, uh, George Washington did. I'm talking, of course, about the Thomas Pynchon novel, which recently came out to mixed acclaim. I would say it's far superior to uh, Vineland, although perhaps um, it's not quite as substantial as Gravity's Rainbow. But I refer to Gravity's Rainbow or any of the other books of Thomas Pynchon, which I've read, in fact, which is in fact all of them, except I don't think I've actually plowed my way through the entirety of his collection of short stories entitled Slow Learner. By the way, if you're looking for a good short story to read, try hunting up Virginia Woolf's short story, The Mark on the Wall. Right up there is uh, The Rats in the Wall by H.P. Lovecraft or um, The Turn of the Screw by 
Henry James. It's, um, in a, it's in a collection called Haunted House, although it might be in another collection of her short stories, um, which rec more recently came out, which would be easier to find, no doubt. Anyhow, um, quoting from Thomas Jefferson, Denial foreclosed, the least touch of humor, the smallest shred of irony. Consent has replaced coercion as the operative principle of government and political power. If it aspired to be legitimate authority, it needed to pass muster with a majority of the citizenry. Again, quoting the sage of Monticello, a choice by the people themselves is not generally distinguished for its wisdom. Hey, wait a minute, I thought he was a great Democrat. What's he doing saying stuff like a choice by the people themselves is not generally distinguished for its wisdom? Doesn't sound very democratic to me. Well, as Jacek Jofi puts it, the language any society, whether the medieval or modern, uses to express its collective anxiety and to legitimize its eliminational, eliminationalist fantasy, the enemy is endowed with a monstrous ideology, a corrupting allure, vast powers, a deadly design, the quest for total domination. Evil must be stopped before the tentacles of the octopus have enveloped us all, as indeed they are threatening to do at any time, depending on just who the enemy is. I can see I'm going to probably have to uh, video dub over this footage, uh, in which case you will not have seen the corrupt footage, which I'm not supposed to be running, because I won't be running it. I'll be running something entirely different. It looks like a sort of a soap opera to me. I do hope I get around to doing this, because they've already warned me once about using copyrighted material in my broadcast. Meaning, I can get away with it once, maybe even twice, but not three times. So, I'm going to watch that. Well, who's to say that someday I won't be able to go over all this stuff and do it right this time, the second time around. John Wayne did not just have political opinions, he embodied a politics. See? There you go, says the learned Gary Wills. A myth does not take hold without expressing many truths Misleading truths, usually, but important ones. Truth, for one thing, to the needs of those who elaborate and accept the myth. Truth to the, to the demand for some control over complex realities. Truth to the recognition of shared values, however shakily grounded those values may be in themselves. Even the myths that simplify are not, in themselves, simple. We all live with lies, with lost passions, friends left behind, potential selves that lie buried in what we become. Our own life is a burial place for our youth. Critics love to oppose popular verdicts and find unsuspected depths in unlikely sources. Say, John Wayne movie. The object of myth is to provide a logical mode capable of overcoming a contradiction. An unrealizable task when the contradiction is real. Or as Stanley Milgram put it in his famous series of experiments, with numbing regularity, good people were seen to knuckle under the demands of authority and perform actions that were callous and severe. Men who are in everyday life responsible and decent were seduced by the trappings of authority into performing harsh acts. Hey, that Stanley guy, he sounds like he's got a lot on the ball. Well... After that, what more can one possibly say? We hear about hungry children all the time, but I know after I've had a big meal, I'm falling asleep in my chair during Senate meetings. I need some coffee just to concentrate. Well, that's a pretty harsh thing to say, to quote Gary Wills. And if some senator said it, State Senator Harold Hofstadter from Washington State. Well, here we go. Some journalist stuff here. 
cited from In These Times of March 14, 1997. I would hold Palestinians fast to my ethical standards only after Israel had removed its boot. Whoops, no, that's not about journalists, sorry. The left really likes to bash Israel, but maybe they have a point. I don't know. Because, you know, the New Republic is like the chief cheerleader of the Israeli state. Not an opinion, but a fact. If journalists cannot freely report news which disturbs the wealthy and powerful, then we'll learn only what the big boys want us to learn, and they'll make our decisions for us, says Studs Terkel, quoted by Joel Blythus. The impenetrable ideological armor protecting corporate media from criticism, says Robert McChesney. We can't print a story like that. It'll affect the stock. Hey, I hear you're causing trouble. We can't go with that story of yours. Better uh, work on something else for a while. According to Thielen, the disintegration of traditional political constituencies fostered the emergence of the opinion industries that invented the means for listening. Market research, opinion polls, focus groups, civilian and military surveillance, and the means for speaking, advertising campaigns, public relations spin doctors, that now distort politics. But this kind of listening and speaking denigrated individuals as uniform components of audiences or markets as submerged in masses whose voice existed only when it could be quantified by the techniques of opinion management. For their part, Thielen argues, polls get used to representing this seemingly new kind of citizen who moved in masses suddenly and decisively. As a result, our leaders lost the capacity to see and hear individual citizens even when their voices are on the other end of phone lines or in the pages of letters being answered in senators' offices. Uninformed and misinformed, pauperized or overworked, misled or betrayed by their leaders, financial, industrial, political, and ecclesiastical, the people are suspicious, weary, and very, very busy, but they are nonetheless the first, last, and best appeal in all great human cases. Certainly, the first rule for the political reformer is, go to the voters. And the reason seems to be, not that the people are better than their betters, but that they are more disinterested. They are not possessed by possessions. They have not so many things and friends. They can afford, they are free to be fair. And, though each individual in the great crowd lacks some virtues, they are altogether, they altogether have what no individual has. A combination of all the virtues, says Lincoln Stevens in 1909. Well, according to the Nation of April 21st, in modern journalistic discourse, as in our national political dialogue, the politics of compromise has become synonymous with the politics of reason. When a politician moves toward the center, or when an intellectual revises a principle based on what is deemed realistic, editors, journalists, and think tank specialists are quick to hail the shift as a sign of experience and refined judgment. In these post-ideological times, the failure to be flexible on matters of conviction is almost guaranteed to raise suspicion says I.L. Press. As Erwin Kroll put it, to be secure in the knowledge that your government counts you among its enemies is a grand feeling. At least in a democracy where they don't take you out and shoot you at dawn. Joe Kennedy said that his three favorite expressions were duh, uh, and the fact of the matter is. He's getting onto an entirely different tack. Ex FBI head William Sessions used a seven car caravan just to ca cross the street. Louis Free has been accused of hiding in a bunker, of becoming J. Edgar Hoover with kids, of surrounding himself with paranoid loyalists, friends of Louis, or FOL. Louis Free, current head of the FBI, has been called the Genghis Khan of turf grabbers. 
So, anyway, things to keep in mind. Maybe the government will make me its enemy. Actually, I want the government to outlaw me, as I've said before, so I can be sold in front of housing projects for $20 a gram. Well, continuing then with the Wrong Heroes Monumental. Number 16 of 24 parts, Eclipse. And now we finally have an eclipse to actually boast about. So i got to get rid of that first 30 minutes or so. We're going to have about an hour's worth of eclipse just for the kitties. And uh, that should be fun. Did you know that Allen Ginsberg invented the expression flower power? I'm telling you, it takes a poet. Did you know that sparkling white grape champagne is Jell-O's 100th anniversary flavor? Better snap it up. You know, if you had an original Jell-O package from 1897, you'd probably be a wealthy man. It's funny what people collect. Well, some might say I'm punching above my weight, that I'm engaged in a losing cause of looking for God's weaknesses, that I'm running in place, or rather that I'm walking in place, that I'm on the cutting edge of nostalgia, that these are simply snide trips, that I'm just that close to actually going postal, that I am basically just spouting 30,000 words. You can say about 30,000 words in two hours. Well, actually, I think someone once said that 30,000 words is the amount of words that a man speaks in a given day. Not me, though. I certainly don't speak 30,000 words. The average person engaged in normal, everyday interactions speaks some 30,000 words every day. I find that incredibly hard to believe. What is normal social interaction? What are you, a chatterbox? Maybe if you're like a telephone operator or something. 30,000 words, that's a lot of words. I mean, you know, you can get through 100, even 1,000 words, like that, like that, and, you know, think nothing of it, but 30,000 words. Think of that. You know, a man's lifetime is only 30,000 days. So if he spoke one word a day, if he were an unusually non-talkative type, if he averaged one word a day, if he were a monk or something, then that would be as much as the so-called average man speaks in one day. So in a sense, the 30,000 words we speak in one day are emblematic of the 30,000 days that comprise our lifetime. There's the makings of a fancy poem that would be published in a third-rate poetry journal put out by some podunk cow college out in rural Montana somewhere uh, in that, but I'm not going to pursue it. Time is short. Oh, but, uh, but I have been working on my um, epic poem on the O.J. Simpson trial. A tragic guard, a tragic dog, guards the spoor of his slain master at the gates of the burned forest. Ralph Reed, right-wing Christian top dog, up and quit. Dole bailed out Speaker Newt with a cool $300,000 loan. Infantine in stature but not regard, Robert Reich has been telling all, read Bill Clinton, the Arkansas fellow traveler. Looking to the future, folks in Wakadugu will be the first, or at least among the first, to greet the new millennium. The famous last words of Peruvian terrorist Nestor Carper, which will certainly reverberate until the last syllable of recorded time, were reported as, We're screwed! Bill Clinton reveals himself as a master of comic timing when, reporting on his daughter's acceptance to Stanford, he says dolefully, The bad news is, 
will be losing a daughter. There is then the slightest of pauses. Immediately his voice becomes brisk and upbeat, and he says, The good news is, we'll have an extra room at the White House. Gary Kasparov, high check chess muckety muck, and most exalted potentate, loses to Deep Blue. In July, Providence hosted the annual Mobile Robot Competition, featuring soccer playing cyborgs. All-knowing and infinitely beneficent science, merely a facet, one among many of his will, reveals that the curiously named St. John's wort is being popularly prescribed by the Germans for depression. We're also reliably informed that latex gloves, among other things, cause allergies. In other news, Donald Trump gives a bunch of inner-city youths new sneakers. One asks why Trump doesn't pay his college tuition instead. My old buddy, my old high school friend Steve Cars was recently named one of Newsweek's 25 Outstanding Individuals of the Year. To be sure, along with cartoon character Dilbert, for the National Enquirer's groundbreaking coverage in Le Faire O.J., Norman Mailer recently published a book narrated from the point of view of Jesus the Nazarene. George Gerbner likens television to a religio-fascist movement, the likes of which he fought against in World War II. Well, did you know that two rejected titles for books written by Raymond Chandler were Lament But No Tears and All Guns Are Loaded. Did you know that Charles Dickens' Martin Chuzzlewit almost came into the world as Martin Sweetledoo? Or that in March, a Japanese militia group surrounded the compound of a foe man with sound trucks and for two solid hours gave forth with the following chant. Hadayama, kill yourself. Hadayama, resign. Hadayama, kill, kill. Hadayama, smash him to death. Well, I'm not the first, and I'll hardly be the last, to trace the source of all of our present day woes to World War I, also known as the Great War. Prior to that, of course, there was no mass communication via radio. Therefore, propaganda was restricted to political cartoons and exhortatory posters as a truly mass medium of indoctrinization. Prior to World War I, there was no data, no surrealism, no performance art, no conceptual art, no modernism, no postmodernism, no premillennial post-ironic Weltschmerz. And there were rules and conventions, and therefore the ability to alter expectation by operating outside of them. The Republic of Texas had the government in a standoff for a little while. They have a website that says, if you are in favor of freedom, click here. Well, in any event, people say the nicest things about me when I beg them to. Oh, uh, now isn't this, oh, I saved this. There's this ad. Mom, Metamins, defeat 90s stress for the kids. Hyperactive children driving you and themselves a little wacko. Try safe, specially formulated. Take it easy, hyper kids. Calm them down. Make them and yourself more productive. Take it easy, hyper kids. Sounds like something you'd give to a goat. Well, anyhow, um, that's the uh, well-written portion of my presentation. Now we get back to free association and stream of consciousness gobbledygook. I'm sorry, gobbledy Chinese-American. That word is 
prohibited. Gosh, I don't got an awful lot here anymore. Why are politicians so reluctant to ask forgiveness, to indulge in self-deprecatory humor? They're so self-obsessed and pampered, they just can't imagine they've done anything wrong, ever, says Fred Barnes in the Weekly Standard of April 14th. It's really miraculous how in the space of what will be less than three years, a magazine, a full-fledged magazine, one which can stand with pride among the other full-fledged magazines, has been formed out of nothingness, basically the evil twin of the New Republic, although they really have to stretch some to be more conservative than the New Republic has become lately, as others have observed. Since the fall of the Roman Empire, says the spectator, Petronio Wyatt, nothing has become Italy quite so much as occupation. If some nations are full of misfits, Italy has myth-fits. It's a country that only really exists in the mind of foreigners. As recently as the first half of the 18th century, foreigners could and often did regard Italy as a nation of powder pink poofs. It was the Italians who invented the walker, usually a homosexual man who escorts married women. Cavalier Servente, he was known as. Well, that's awfully nice to know, especially if one is of Italian ancestry as Indeed, the wrong hero, although, of course, an alien, claims to be. Well, you know, there's no use complaining. Tomorrow is already here. Yep, we're getting uh, pretty thin on the ground when it comes to uh, political stuff here. Minority parties and liberals have something in common. They were both named by their enemies, Mensheviks. A liberal believes that cruelty is the worst thing that we do, says Judith Sklar in the New Leader of March 10th. And it's funny about the New Leader. I mean, it comes out so irregularly in, uh, during the, uh, you know, from September to about May. It only comes out like maybe, I don't know, 10 times a year. And then in the summertime, unlike every other journal I know of, it has extra issues. It comes out like once every three weeks or something. I guess like everybody that writes for it is like in academia or something. <laughs> or, you know, they just have the time to do this sort of thing. Keep up with current events when nothing is happening. So, just thought I'd share that with you. Lord Byron, according to Grosskirk, citing Terry Castle in the New York Times Book Review of April 13th, Lord Byron, the poet, was a basically decent man, destroyed by the expectations and projections of an incomprehensible world into which fate had thrust him. Yes, he was trapped in a world he never made, you might say. <coughs> well, I certainly hope that heaven is my destination. That's all I can say. The student newspapers of Ivy League schools are basically prep schools for the loose magazine, says John Leonard. And, and you know, Shelley said, he, he um, wrote about Castlereagh. I met Murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be an admirable plight. For one by one and two by two, he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. More about Metternich and Castlereagh. They were determined to reimpose peace and order. They believed the Napoleonic Wars were the sort of ghastliness that happens when countries try to export the rights of man. Order, they argued, had to be maintained through a balance of power which states did not challenge each other, in which states did not challenge each other's legitimacy. Rights versus order, liberals versus realists, 
Gladstone, Wilson, Carter, Reagan versus Teddy Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, Kissinger, Bismarck, Disraeli. Yeah, that's really what it comes down to. Carter versus Kissinger. Carter versus Reagan. Wilson versus Nixon. Gladstone versus Disraeli. Well, we are, of course, in high Gladstone mode. <coughs> More Americans expect to win the lottery than see the federal budget balanced in the near future. 47% of voters prefer root canal surgery to an IRS audit. Well, I've had root canal surgery. It costs about $1,200 including the new gold or um, com your composite tooth that they put in your mouth. And I don't know that if in my case a IRS audit would end up costing me $1,200 since that would be about 10% of my income. Because I just don't make that much money. Stay home, have plenty of alibis so you can't be framed if something happens. Says Militia of Montana, John Trochman to his followers every April 19th. It's Militia Day. April 19th was like the last big show I did. It's already what? Beginning of August. I'm getting rusty. It's been four months since I've done a major show. Nearly two months since I've even done a minor show. Except, of course, for these presentations. As the 1964 Yale campus turned left, George Bush stuck with the apolitical foam heads in the Deke House. He was tapped for skull and bones, as his father had been, and gladly accepted. The foam heads. You see, that's, that's where I got the phrase foam heads. You never know when you're going to find a great new word. One cannot, obviously, spend one's entire life reading a thesaurus to find these words. Certain words just will not be found in such a place. She crowed in an insight only congenital ill will can produce. This was said in the American Spectator of May 1997 of Maureen Dowd. You get yourself up to speed just by smiling and being friendly, and pretty soon everyone else is friendly back at you. People will feel resentful if they are left out, but if they are made part of the group, they will usually shoulder the burdens and responsibilities of the group fairly readily. Thus, you should let people into your group, and if you feel you are on the outside, don't hate the people on the inside, but make legitimate efforts to become part of the group, says Ben Stein. Always full of helpful advice. Bill Clinton is the lucky fellow in the big boy coveralls who stayed home and was there to receive the souvenir baton from the conquering heroes. He had nothing to do with it except to watch and open his hand to get the gifts, says Ben Stein, concerning Bill Clinton's non-participation in perhaps the worst war America has ever fought. Well, There's not much about politics in the issue of George magazine from May of 1997, except this juicy quote from George Washington. Government is not reason. It is not eloquence. It is force. Well, anyway. the decline of liberalism as a viable force in U.S. politics, according to John Stossel. The liberal, the L word, 1988, gave conservatism a target too feckless to defend itself. The redefinition of elitism benefited Rush Limbaugh the most. Liberal glam, 
This new elite is the conservatives' sworn enemy, but also their lifeblood. Without it, they can seem like rich white men grousing about a world they can't control. With it, they are suddenly the populace. It is really this reconfigured populism without the tenet of economic justice, which Rush Limbaugh exemplifies. The condescension of the elites is Rush's launch pad. Frozen out of spin the bottle then, frozen out of New York society now. Other conservatives may have had an intellectual attachment to the cause. Limbaugh's, like Nixon's, was emotional, born of slights and hurts. His talent, again not unlike Nixon's, was translating personal resentments into political ones that his listeners could share. Point man for the revenge of the non-intellectual nerd. Not the sly rule gang who were too far gone to even know they were nerds, but the ones who wanted acceptance. And if liberals take most of his fire, it's because they represent everything he and his audience are not. Liberals got the girls. The truth of talk radio is that it is more a revival meeting of true believers than a town meeting of average Americans. Press coverage of Rush Limbaugh is even more focused on Limbaugh than his listeners are. The most amazing thing about Limbaugh's survival, much less his acceptance by the mainstream media, is that the, the bulk of what he says is surprisingly mean, ugly, and stupid. Celebrity is so much stronger a bond than politics. As long as Limbaugh remains a celebrity, and as long as he doesn't espouse racism, he can pretty much say whatever he wants to say. It is a great formula, this mix of McCarthyism, humor, racial tolerance, and celebrity. And it has given Limbaugh not only money and fame, but also a kind of legitimacy and authority. But as a showbiz personality, Limbaugh will always be judged by the standards of showbiz. Meteoric rises have only one second act, the fall. Hey, when's Rush's new book going to come out anyway? He, he, he did two in rapid succession. I guess he ran out of things to say. Demagogues fizzle out because people weary of the old act or because the political equation changes or because they face a real political challenge, says Alexander Cockburn, cited by John Stossel. A demagogue wins his following by going on the offensive. His following gives him credibility, but also another constituency to satisfy the mainstream media, which invariably take notice. Limbaugh may wind up alienating the mainstream press that be bestowed that celebrity. He may discover that he is just an injudicious word away from being marginalized, as Father Coughlin and Walter Winchell were. 20 million people telling each other how much they hate Hillary says Paul Begala on Rush Limbaugh's audience. If he doesn't self-destruct, he will probably just roll along like radio anachronism Paul Harvey, master of a faith that now seems to meet, lead nowhere. Or as George Carlin put it, most people work just hard enough not to get fired and get paid just enough money not to quit. Hardly the case with Rush Limbaugh who, whatever else you might say about him, is a very hard worker. He probably reads more stuff than I do every week. Of course, he reads it with his own little filter, just as I do. When you shoot to the top of the pundit food chain just a year after shedding your lawyer's pinstripes without any tedious apprenticeships, no good deed goes unchallenged. Accused in her call for forgiveness for gay bashing of a haphazard, self-limiting approach to public policy, one-to-one -one conversions are no substitute for empathy, says Margaret Carlson in Time magazine about Laura Ingraham. Doesn't a commentator have a responsibility to do research before venturing an opinion, even if it means looking outside your own tribe? says Margaret Carlson on Laura Ingraham. Well, that was a real tempest in a teapot. I don't even remember what the big flap was. My goal is to goad guests into saying something that ruins their life, says Don Inus. 
Howard Stern, like a balky kid in therapy, speaks to the inner churl. Imus, the seen-it-all skeptic with a curiosity beyond his groin, speaks to the inner policy wonk. Imus is the best political interviewer. He's read everything, and he gets to the heart of everything, says Maureen Dowd. Here's a charming bumper sticker. Have you cleaned your assault weapon today? See, whenever these uh, newspaper pundits, these guys that write these three times a week columns, whenever they run out of sh stuff to say, I'm trying to keep my language clean for the kiddies in the audience, they, uh, they come up with these asinine compilations of their favorite bumper stickers, not realizing, or perhaps realizing all too well, that it's like basically just a bunch of one-liners that are in the public domain by dint of their having been published as bumper stickers. What kind of a lame person puts bumper stickers on their car for no real purpose? I mean, I can see putting a uh, bumper sticker announcing your devotion to a political candidate if, especially if, you expect to benefit from it thereby. But what's with putting out bumper stickers on the back of your car that say things like shit happens or unless you're a hemorrhoid, get off my ass. Wow, that's quite an eclipse there. So, anyway, getting back to the subject, which was politics. In the New Republic of April 28th, and Say what you will about the New Republic, you can always count on it to have an opinion on virtually everything having to do with politics, even if it's something that will disappear from the radar screen in the most veritable blink of an eye. I can tell when I've been working hard and when I've been sort of just skimming these things. This is from a period mid-April when I was, in fact, working quite hard. The conjunction of email and politics creates curious subcultures. On Capitol Hill, it seems to have made the horse race metaphor literal, turning clean-cut staffers into scheming bookies. A cyberspace pool, to guess the day Newt will step down. A new pool on who will get his job. Army, DeLay, Paxton, Kasich, John Burmer, Bob Livingston, Henry Hyde. Again, the prescient Hannah Rosen. While no one will admit they really want Newt's job, members of the leadership have started indiscreetly laying each other, eyeing each other like rival thieves, like rival steeds, crudely sizing up their competitors before the big race. Jealousy Jealously, they record each other's aggressive moves. New staffers hired, new legislation approved. Army, DeLay, Bomer, they're the real reptile conservatives. In these times, where nothing but subtle scheming is allowed, reaching out and campaigning are indistinguishable, says Hannah Rosen on Army. Dick Army. Dick Army may give in sometimes out of necessity, but you can't change his mind on anything. He's basically inflexible. His notion of coming up with a new idea is call Milton Friedman, who of course, as we all know, as any schoolboy knows, is head of the Federal Reserve. The Tom DeLay is the unfiltered id of republicanism, the conservative in the raw that some in the party have long wanted to see in power. Maybe because he's from a bomb-proof Republican district, maybe because he's crazy enough to do it, DeLay relishes his role as party guinea pig. Ideas that the more respectable, respectable members are too embarrassed to discuss, to discuss are handed to DeLay. He floats the strange balloons and cackles wildly as they burst over his head says Hannah Rosen in an unusually colorful, even for her, metaphor. Burmer. He loves to 
sun on the beach with oil and a towel with his buddies around him. No one wants a party boy as speaker. Kasich. He's too juvenile. He talks before he thinks. It's like he has attention deficit disorder. It's impossible for him to focus on anything for more than 20 seconds without him doddering. But these things are treatable. What you say about Paxson? Oh, nothing. After Gingrich, choosing high would be like admitting defeat, like going back to live at your parents' house. So, so much for that. Of course, we all know how it shook out. Paxson made a preemptory challenge. Everybody else pulled back. Newt's protege is in Coventry, although they're giving him this uh, do-nothing ceremonial title in the Republican Party and sort of uh, rewarding him in a backhanded way for having challenged the obnoxious Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich is the best we can do. The towers of Camelot and the ruin of Watergate serve as the two sovereign metaphors for the political history of the United States over the past quarter century. That sounds a lot like Gore Vidal, no? Mm, who knows who said that? Lewis Lapham? Mm. No, this is in Harper's. Yeah, maybe it was Lewis Lapham. Capitalism is like a broom. It sweeps the world clean and always stays in a dirty corner, says Ben Catcher, who writes the Julius Nipple um, real estate photographer comic strip, which is such a popular success among a certain small elite. Which is not to put him down. I think every newspaper in the land should carry it. And if he had the... Uh, wherewithal to make it a daily strip, I would read it faithfully. There are two Americas, says Mark Rangel in Time Magazine of April 28th. The original American Republic we know from history books and personal experiences, and the subterranean shadow republic that has always been taking shape since the turbulent 1960s. It is this struggle between the dying First Republic and the burgeoning Second Republic that is haunting the American people. The only way to save our national sanity is to acknowledge the existence of the Second Republic so we can deal realistically with the problems that led to its birth. And the sooner, the better. Well getting into some miscellaneous stuff now, as if all of this hasn't simply been jumping from one topic to the next. According to Robert Reich, a cabinet job is a glamorous temp job. It is nothing more than that. Tony Blair has been called Bambi and Stalin. Tony Blair on Bill Clinton. You don't run on one basis and govern on the other. GOP speaker at the 1984 GOP convention. When was the last time you heard a Democrat say no? Tony Blair. Even if we could win as old labor, we shouldn't. This is all the postmortems of the uh, prime minister's race. Well, I have to start eating more chickpea salad. That'll help me re reduce my hypertension. Ah, yes, the ongoing debate between vengeance rights and victims' rights. Just, uh, breezing through here. This repetitive motion sickness by which we are driven, like doomed sheep leaping in a sleepless dream, nowhere but over and over and over the same unmoving ground, says the poetical Patricia J. Williams 
in the nation of May 5th. There is no greater pleasure in life than giving liberal pretensions a sound kick in the backside, says Alexander Cockburn. And here's an odd quote, supposedly from Lenny Bruce in 1968, although I think he died in 1966. Fascism in America is kept solvent by the left-wing hunger for persecution. Liberals will buy anything any bigot writes. For example, the uh, two books by Rush Limbaugh mentioned earlier. Now, if it gets out, you know, Rush finds out I've been slandering him like this, all of his weight might come to bear against me, and that would be quite a tragedy, considering how much he weighs. Ah, yes. Campaigns and elections of April of 1997. They always seem to be kind of floundering around after a major election. They can't really do more than one post-mortem, so then they get right back on track and assume that everybody is still highly interested in politics and what they have to say about politics. Now, it's a pretty nifty magazine if you are running for public office. I would say virtually indispensable in that regard. Ah, yes, it's been a long eclipse, indeed, from the First Republic to the Second Republic, so eloquently explicated. Now, what's this? My address book here. Who's she been calling? Oh, Chuck McDonald. I think I'll erase the messages. In case someone calls me, right, then I'll know that it was a call for me and not for, say, Philip Morris. Anyway, in campaign elections, they talk about uh, how to be a good campaign manager. Put aside any hint of arrogance in your tone or manner. Be nice to everyone on your way up because it's a long way down. Practice active listening with everyone. Never walk away from someone who is speaking to you. The words, I'm sorry, can be extremely effective. Be direct but polite when asking someone to do something. Do not let yourself sound rushed or harassed. Don't use a rote greeting with anyone. Use a respectful tone with everyone. Warm gestures how kind deeds and comments are memorable. I'm going to have to keep that in mind. I think I'll earmark that page. U.S. Grant was the great white father. Bill Clinton is little big horny, says Bill Maher. If you want to wipe out the national debt, let's open up a chain of white houses all across the country, says Jay Leno. You can't beat somebody with nobody said old Joe Cannon, cover boy for the very first issue of Life, Life magazine, of, of Time magazine, and incidentally, Speaker of the House, and perhaps the most powerful Speaker of the House we've had since Tip O'Neill or Newt Gingrich. You can't win an election with money alone, says Marion Barry, who should know. Promises and pie crusts are made to be broken, says Jonathan Swift. Be thankful, only one of them can win, says a bumper sticker. Do not run a campaign that would embarrass your mother, says Robert Byrd, Senator of West Virginia, I believe it is. Well, now Bob Dole has got an unfortunate reputation as Newt Gingrich's loan shark. Although, people don't talk much about that anymore. Now they're more focused on Newt Gingrich than on what Bob Dole gave or did not give to Newt Gingrich in the way of fundage. 
Newt Gingrich, it's not ethics. To the GOP rank and file, his real sin is pissing up the liberals. If Newt is turned out, says David Brooks in Newsweek of April 28th, it may have as much to do with the rank and file resentment over his social climbing. Right wingers suspect he's forever lost his nerve. And that is a thing called sad. Well, leaping ahead, Louis Farrakhan is so far out of his gourd that at times he appears to be almost literally beside himself. But nuts is not the same as stupid, says the controversial Michael Kelly in the New Republic of May 5th. <coughs> See, we're already into May, and it's September. At this rate, <coughs> we'll be in June by October, or perhaps by mid-September. And we'll be in July by early October. And we'll be in August by mid-October. And we'll be in September by late October. And we'll be in October by early November. And we'll be in November by mid-November. Or late November. By the time November ends, we should have finished this, in other words. Perhaps there will be a final wrap-up for the 24th and final of these series of shows, which, since it's September 9th, I project. Let's see, let me talk a little bit about the future here. There is an inevitable trailing off. This is... Um, the 16th of 24 shows, and I expect that we will finish. Oh, we might even finish by November 4th. Uh, maybe not. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Well, according to this, November 4th, with the main bulk of it. And then there will be a one week hiatus. We won't have any programming on November 11th. And then, uh, on November 18th, and if we have a show on November 25th, then uh, we'll probably finish this by the end of November, which is pretty good. It takes a year, it takes uh, six months to cover a year's worth of political chicanery. I was looking to see if that was my Inamorata coming in, but apparently it is not. She's not home yet. So. Got to keep a weather eye out. So let's see. In the next 15 minutes of our eclipse, what do we have? It's hard to stay above the fray. Well, there's the title of a poem for you. It's hard to stay above the fray, but I got to do it every day. More like Edgar Guest than real poetry. There's a difference between populism and liberalism. Populism means listening to the people and hearing what they have to say. Liberalism says the people are idiots. Let's go find out what the experts think. Minneapolis used to listen to the people. Now it's just like every other American city. Jeez. Okay. If you feel that strongly about it. You know what Kate Clinton said about the cloned sheep? Oh, great, just what we need, more sheep. A good point. Baclav Havel put it well when he said, Optimism is the belief that things are going to turn out as you like, as opposed to hope which is when you are thoroughly convinced something is moral and right and just, and therefore you fight regardless of the consequences. Well, I'm fighting regardless of the consequences, which will probably entail losing what little listenership I have, because I insist on plowing forward with this ill-considered and even more ill-conceived project. 
There is a strange relationship between the system of a country and its people. In England, the people are hostile to a man, but the system is compassionate. The very old, the very young, and the ill-equipped to live will always be looked after. In America, everyone is friendly, almost doggy-like, but the system is ruthless. Once you can be pronounced unproductive, you've had it, says Quentin Crisp, resident alien. Hey, now there's a, um, there's an idea for a title, resident alien. In fact, uh, change that to president alien, and uh, we got ourselves making of a fine best-selling novel, which actually I've already written the first chapter of. So don't you go trying to steal my ideas. Of course, if anybody's still tuned in here, they're too devoted to the wrong hero to ever try to steal his ideas, unless the only possible reason and justification they have for listening is, in fact, for that very purpose. Well, according to John O'Sullivan in The New Republic, when a worldview is false, it can be sustained only by constant reinforcement. And when an orthodoxy is threatened by truth, then the orthodox beat down the doubt in their hearts by beating down the heretic in their midst. Clinton's mindset is one of total denial about the seriousness of the scandal surrounding him. He's too much into denial on the one hand and too much of an ingrate to arrange hush money to Webster Hubble on the other. Mike Curry was of the opinion that people don't think we're honest enough to be president regarding President Clinton. One of Winston Smith's jobs in the Ministry of Truth was to eliminate inconvenient items from documents and photographs. There was this whole big flap about uh, stuff that the, new Repu that the National Review published on its cover demeaning racially stereotyped caricatures of Oriental people. And so they're all in a lather about how uh, people are judging them and they shouldn't be sensitively challenged, says Sadie Field. Racial shakedown artist, says Tony DeFusco. And um, a, a woman named Laurie L. Broomhall had a very sensible comment, actually. It's in bad taste to decide what's offensive to other folks. Jeez, whatever that means. Conservatives do not live on happiness either, along with the French, who André Moirot said, do not live on happiness. This is what Flo King has to say. Contempt will continue to breed as long as television supplies the familiarity. The up-close and personal view of our leaders puts us in such proximity to every facial tick, nervous gesture, and unconscious habits that we react in ways once limited to the custom staled marriage bed and the jaundiced view across the breakfast table. Liberals are immune to this because they don't crave loftiness, but conservatives feel forlorn at the merest hint of clay feet in their leaders. If it weren't for C-SPAN, I never would have known that Newt Gingrich talks like a term paper in heat, but I know it now, says the always witty and eminently readable Florence King, who incidentally writes on the last page of the New Republic. The last page of many journals, by the way, is one of the best places for the initiate to wet his or her feet when it comes time to decide whether they should make regular readership of said journal a habit. Because uh, generally the last page is the last word, and it in a sense serves, if not literally, at least symbolically, as a 
summation of the entire issue. For the longest time, U.S. News and World Report had, and probably still has, that tedious message from the publisher that they publish that nobody reads. The Weekly Standard publishes a parody to end, a, to end on a note of levity. Campaigns and elections um, has a page of uh, political quotes from varied sources. Uh, it's almost always like a formula. One letterman, one leno, um, a couple of ex-presidents, a speaker of the house or two, a governor in the news perhaps, and then out. But it's, a, it's an effective formula. See, the thing is, uh, the more I read these things, the more I realize that I could be writing for any one of these magazines if I really wanted to get involved in everything which that ability would entail. And I'm not quite sure I do want to. So anyway, uh, yeah, the New Republic had its Cambridge Diarist, but, or whatever, the Jerusalem Diarist, New York Diarist. But uh, for my money, oh, and... Uh, the American Spectator has uh, conventional wisdom by assorted jackasses, although they don't refer to them thusly anymore. That used to be the only thing I read in the American Spectator. Now it's virtually the only thing I skip besides the lengthy articles, which inevitably in every issue talk about one peccadillo or another of the Clinton administration. But National Review has a really good last page. And I hope that for long as Flo King chooses to write it, they continue to run it. The revolution of contempt, says Florence King, is as old as television. But interestingly, it never touched Nixon, whose gift for inspiring towering emotions never flagged. The hatred was pure and the pity was Aristotelian, pulsing with talk of hubris and tragic flaws. The temptation to shine the lamp of antiquity on Nixon proved irresistible to his critics, and ultimately armored him. A man called Agonistes simply does not invite contempt. She's referring to the book Nixon Agonistes by Gary Wills, which was one of his first and best books of those I've read. Gary Wills is quite a hot ticket. <coughs> you could pull down virtually any one of his books from a library shelf and uh, it would be a worthwhile thing to read if you're in want of reading material. You know, I checked out his John Wayne book, but I never actually got around to reading it. I think there's movie stars that I'm somewhat more interested in than John Wayne. And I'm not sure, after reading all the reviews and scrupulously notating the highlighted quotes that I wanted to keep, that it was worth the chore of actually finding the original citations and copying them out all over again. Well, according to Florence King, Bill Clinton, his lying is affectless, and his appetites are compulsive, and Human Events has been running a huge ad for a book that calls him a psychopath. Stand by for mirthless smile. This is not contempt, but fascination. Again, she makes a good point, somewhat partisan, but not entirely so in comparing Bill Clinton and the fascination that the media have for him and his quirks with Nixon and Ditto. So, we're talking Eclipse, so I suppose in order to uh, really round this out and observe the Aristotelian unity, I should actually talk a little bit about Eclipse. Hopefully some of the notations I've been taken, taking will bear me out in my notion of the eclipse between the original America of the imagination and the current brutish America. Why were we so fascinated by those students facing down those tanks at Tiananmen Square in 1989? Because it was only 20 years ago that students protesting the Vietnam War were doing the very same thing in Washington, D.C. during the mobilization, the moratorium against the war.
both China and the United States were undergoing something of a left-wing insurrection within their own borders. But of course, left-wing in China is democracy, and left-wing in a democracy is a, a sort of totalitarianism, which uh, is kind of interesting. And I should jot that down because it is a very good point. Left-wing in a totalitarian state. means democracy. Left wing in a democracy leads to totalitarianism. Yes, indeed. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Next pa. The real Suharto lobby in the United States consists in large part of the powerful U.S. corporations that see Indonesia as a profit playground. Imagine an elected official saying, we need more unemployment, we need lower wages, I don't want you people to make any more money. That's essentially what Alan Greenspan said when he decided to raise interest rates in March. Ah, oh, quick picking on Greenspan. Quite simply, the Fed buckled under to big banks and major industrialists, says Jack Kemp. Starting in May, anyone sponsoring a relative must prove an ability to support that person at 125% of the poverty level. This is for immigrants. I myself don't believe in so-called political poetry. I believe what a poet does is he writes his mind, and like everybody else, his mind is concerned with sex, dope, and everyday living, politics included. Forget dictatorial monotheists from Pat Robertson to Stalin who believe that poetry should be moral, defined in their own terms. Ellen Ginsberg, cited by Matthew Rothschild in The Progressive of August 1994, also cited in The Progressive of May 1997. Everything you've done since 1960 was for the sake of politics, says Will Durst on Bill Clinton. If ambition were cheese, you'd be Wisconsin. It's all politics. And when you claim they're out to get you for the sake of politics, that's politics. To err it is human, to blame it on the other party, that's politics. Yes, indeed it is. Well, we're coming to the end of our eclipse, so let us go then, you and I, like a constellation spread against the sky, like a patient anesthetized upon a table. Let us go then, you and I and Betty Grable. Well, I guess I'll let this run for a little while longer, even though there, there is now a night sky. Isn't it poetic? Yes, we have become utterly eclipsed. Symbolic media tidbits are my key to enlightenment, says Lloyd Dangle. That's quite a name. Symbolic names like Lloyd Dangle are my key to enlightenment. So, Pat Paulson, in his 1968 run, mock run for the presidency, let the kids today learn sex education where we did, in the gutter. Pat Paulson also declared war on poverty. Shoot 400 beggars a week. He's dead now at age 69. In his 1968 run for president, he won 200,000 votes. Who knows? If he hadn't been in the running, maybe Humphrey would have become president. Quite a thought, huh? Bob Dole is more powerful as coot than president, according to Newsweek of May 5th. Robert Reich is the Samuel Peeps of the Beltway, according to the same source.
Well, according to John M. Arnold, during my tour in Vietnam, I was astonished at my peers' capacity to do exactly what was most likely to make enemies of the people we were there to help. Malicious desecration of shrines, limitless sexual harassment, destruction of people's livelihoods, and other inappropriate forms of behavior were routine. So, anyway, if you want a clue about the American eclipse, let us say that in a nation which was founded as a nation of immigrants, we have become utterly insensitive to the very wretched refuse, so to speak, of other countries that we were initially designed to receive with open arms. Well, this is as good a place as any, I suppose, to uh, break off in our coverage, and we will return with more of the same and, uh, in a very short while. So, stay fit. Well, so it seems as though we don't have any picture for the last half hour. Well, that's about par for the course. Maybe the picture will eventually blink back on, in which case you can actually see a still figure of a masked man instead of utter eclipse. Good thing I called this one Eclipse A, because see that way, instead of being a horrendous production blunder, it's actually an arty effect. So, you know, I have the best of both worlds. If it does come back on about 10 minutes into this, then I'm doing okay. But if it doesn't come back on, then of course it's a product of the eclipse. So, anyhow, I'll check periodically, rest assured. Just to make sure that uh, you're not actually seeing me. Well, anyway, we were talking about uh, Vietnam, yes. And, uh, well, as George Stephanopoulos says, once you reveal yourself, you invite scrutiny. And to invite scrutiny is to invite ridicule. Well, as Matt Bai says about Fife Symington, in Arizona, hubris can be deadlier than a diamondback. Fife Symington's campaign pitch is likely to echo his courtroom defense. J. Simon Fife Symington III, heir to the Frick Steel Fortune, is just a little guy getting pushed around by big government. It's a hard sell, but no one's counting Simonson out. After all, this is Arizona, where scandal is tradition, and hating the feds a way of life. The hard scrabble son of the Maryland Hunt Country, the governor's cousin, Senator Stu Symington, challenged JFK for the White House. Well, anyway, latex semen, cockroaches, and chamomile can cause allergies. This has nothing to do with my presentation, but I thought I'd throw it in. Now here's some uh, rock lyrics for some aspiring band that wants to reach back to the 6th century for their concepts and ideas. This is from an Irish poem of the 6th century called Ad's Head. Across the sea will come Ad's Head, crazed in the head, his cloak with hole for the head, his stick bent in the head. He will chant impiety from a table in front of his house. All of his people will answer, be it thus, be it thus. Of course, you know, the 20th century manifestation of Ad's head is <sighs> me, the wrong hero. So, here's some examples of uh, strange folk sayings. It's a tall man who can clean his gutters without a ladder. It's a tall man who can clean his gutters without a ladder. Fingers for hands, toes for feet. 
A surprise gift is never expected. Big hat on head, useless in bed. These are all old folk sayings. Better a squashed hedgehog than a hedgehog killed by boredom. He who giveth up his seat stands. What cannot be said, let us not say. It's never too late to miss a train. Behind every black poodle is a woman with hairy legs. Speak no ill of the clean-shaven, because they are without a beard. It is a strange telephone directory that contains no numbers. He who kills the dove must gather up the feathers. He who wears his trousers back to front does not fool the wise man. The man who speaks the truth must surely have something to hide. When there's a grandmother, there are three generations. Not all drains lead to the sea. Money does not buy happiness, but it helps. Always remember that says Donald Trump to public school number 70. The press is not thin-skinned, it is no-skinned, says Edward R. Murrow. Elites stucco the rooms of history with myth. Trauma and guilt repress experience. We remember selectively. We forget collectively, says Catherine R. Stimson. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. What did one multiculturalist say to the other? Answer, it doesn't matter. All multicultures are equally worthy of our attention. Multiculturalism represents a kind of symbolic penalty the United States charges itself for having broken yet again the egalitarian social contract on which it was founded, says Nathan Glazer. Every so often, Washington culture chews up a man of ideals and spits him out as a lobbyist, or as a consultant, or some type who makes gobs more money than he used to, working for a cause in which he doesn't believe. And by now, we all shrug. After all, we've learned that the lure of a bigger house and a better car can be as strong here as it is on Wall Street. Rick Santorum says to Don Nichols on Don, uh, who, of Diana Feinstein, what a bitch. Just yet another example of incivility in the Republican ranks. A gutless chicken shit, says Tom DeLay to Representative David Obey. I'd like to meet Representative David Obey, but I think I'd like to meet Tom DeLay even more. Or is it Tom DeLay? should have probably had that comment on a 10 second tape delay if you get my drift. Gee, isn't it nice that we can use all these cuss words because it's cable television? Sure, it's community cable, but still. Cable's the way to go. That was a thumbs up gesture there. You probably didn't see it because we probably have no picture because, well, just because. Because this is the camera. Well, it's supposed to have a picture, you know, I mean, it's acting like it would like to have a picture if it were only given a chance. If I shine an unusually bright light into it, it would probably kick in. But I'm not sure I have the time to dismantle my light source and bring it in here, so I'm not even going to bother. Sorry! Well, we're running uh, pretty much on schedule. Except by the time I finish this, it'll be 1 after 11, and I'll have to be at work at 11.30, which means I'll have to pack my lunch, get undressed, take a shower, get dressed, and drive to work. I should walk, but I don't have the time. And, uh, so, very deep is the well of the past. Should we not call it bottomless? says Thomas Mann, 
in the Little Red, Joseph and his brothers, all five volumes of it. Especially Little Red in its native German by Americans. I can't think of a single American other than my German teacher in high school, Mr. Lang, who read the whole thing in German. Then again, who knows if even he read it in German. What is the message of violence? <sighs> what is the message of violence? Who can get away with what against whom? Result? To make people fearful, says George Gerbner. I think he's talking about TV violence. I don't know if I agree with everything he says about television. Television is a modern-day religion. It presents a coherent vision of the world, violent, mean, repressive, dangerous, and inaccurate. The toxic byproduct of market forces run amok, breeds what fear or resentment mixed with economic frustration can lead to. The undermining of democracy! Ah. The sharp increase in the murder rate in... Where? Australia? New Zealand? Wherever. In some foreign country. The sharp increase in the murder rate in North America, beginning in 1955, was the product of TV viewing, opines Mr. Gerbner. Iran estimated that 10% of the violence in the United States could be attributed to television. Of course, his blood and fairy tales, gore and mythology, murder and Shakespeare, lurid crimes and tabloids, and battles and wars and textbooks. Such representations of violence are le legitimate cultural expressions, even necessary to balance tragic consequences against deadly compulsions. But the historically defined, individually crafted, selectively used symbolic violence of heroism, cruelty, or authentic tragedy has been replaced by the violence with happy endings produced on the dramatic assembly line. Never was a culture so filled with full-color images of violence as ours is now. TV violence is not simple acts, but rather a complex social scenario of power and victimization. The lower classes are almost invisible on television. Villains are disproportionately male, lower class, young, and Latino, Latino, or foreign. The disempowering effects of TV lead to neo-fascism. TV contributes. The violence we see on the screen and read about in the press bears little relationship either in volume or in type, especially in its consequences, to violence in real life. This sleight of hand robs us of the tragic sense of life necessary for compassion. The Frankfurt School tradition teaches and the dangers of the control of the masses by ideological content. TV makes it impossible for parents to control the content of taboos of adult life, says Neil Postman, cited by George Gerdner. Whoever tells most of the stories to most of the people most of the time has effectively assumed the cultural role of parent and school, teaching us most of what we know in common about life and society. It is long-range exposure to TV that contributes, that cultivates fixed conceptions about life in viewers. As Garrison Keillor says, that noted sage and pundit, it's as bloody as Shakespeare, but without the intelligence and the poetry. If you watch TV news, you know less about the world than if you drank gin out of a bottle. Well, I'll have to try that prescription sometime, Gare. If I were permitted to write all of the ballads, I need not care who makes the laws of the nation, said Scottish patriot Andrew Fletcher to the Marquise of Montrose in 1704. Just so you know the full source of that quote. Fletcher identified the governing power of a centralized system of ballads, the songs, legends, and stories that convey both information and what we call entertainment. TV has become this centralized system. 
It is the cultural arm of the state that established religion once was. Television satisfies many previously felt religious needs for participating in a common ritual and for sharing beliefs about the meaning of life and the modes of right conduct. The modern functional equivalent of the government's establishment of religion. To make pain seem painless is sugarcoating power, sugarcoating the message of power. People don't understand that humor can be very violent and very cruel. Humorous stories are easier to digest, easier to absorb, but basically they are all messages of power, messages of who can get away with what against whom. Body counts always rise in action sequels. Escalating the body count seems to be one way to get attention from a public punch drunk on global mayhem. And yeah, that's the title for my next show. Punch Drunk on Global Mayhem. I haven't been notating these things lately. There is no more serious business for a culture or a society than the stories you tell your children. Okay. Children today grow up in a cultural environment that is designed to the specifications of a marketing strategy. The market is a plutocracy, not a democracy. These interests exercise de facto censorship. In co-opting all programming, a media monopoly has consolidated the diversity of human experience into a few basic formulas. U.S. political culture does not permit any discussion of the fundamental weaknesses of, in capitalism. Corporate media have encouraged the belief that even the consideration of alternatives was tantamount to a call for totalitarianism. Call for totalitarianism. The simple, the naked, and the bloody, part of a global formula imposed by creative people and foisted on the children of the world. Viewers have been conditioned to accept the corporate violence doled out to them. Stories by people with something to tell rather than stories by people with something to sell is what we need. A nation, almost by definition, must have some stories the citizens hold in common. No modern state can govern without television. It is the social cement that religion once was. Okay? Okay. Well, anyway, in a learned discussion in the same journal that I quoted these extensive car comments by George Gerbner, no less than the Atlantic of May of uh, May 1997, they talk about the types of Republicans and Democrats that have pretty much run the office of the presidency. In fact, instead of dividing uh, us into two republics, we're really in the fourth republic. Well, the fifth republic, actually, according to this schemata. Everything prior to Lincoln, number one, the Lincoln Republicans, the McKinley Republicans, that, and those two went up to 1932, the New Deal and the Great Society, that goes up to 1968, and the era of divided government from 1969 to the present. So this is the Fifth Republic, and I'm, I guess I'm a fifth columnist. It has nothing to do with newspapers, by the way. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I hope you saw the Pet Shop Boys when they were in New York. I didn't. But I have some boys on my staff who did. Well, there's a lot of stuff about Mark Twain and the Spectator of 19, 19 April. <laughs> in case you're interested in perpetuating Twain mania, I have nothing against it. I just like the sound of it. Twain mania. We're going crazy. All of our Twain novels are half-priced. Huckleberry Finn, the original inspiration for Huckleberry Hound. Uh, yeah, it's too bad about this. I guess it really is an eclipse. 
I should have just recorded it when I was going to originally do it. I could have saved myself half an hour. Ha ha! It's the poor. They're all killing each other again, says Yvonne Brunette in a cartoon in, in these times of April 28th. Now that's savage Swiftian satire for you. When a marginalized and powerless group becomes suckered by another fashion ploy, it is far from being in the driver's seat, says Drigo L. Little in U.S. News and World Report of April 12th. That's so weird, actually. That, that would be a New York U.S. News and World Report. A commodity ap appears at first sight, an extremely obvious, trivial thing. But analysis shows us that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties, says young Karl Marx, cited by Alexander Cockburn. No, 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 Mr. Zapruder, there's a sign in the way. You'll get a much better angle from that grassy knoll. Mr. President, duck! Those two phrases could have changed all of history. And, of course, if we had told Noah, and thou shalt gather the termites and woodpeckers after their kind. As something, Bill Clinton has made something of a hobby of refurbishing washed-up Republican moderates, says Tucker Carlson in the Weekly Standard, not totally inaccurately. Here comes President Bill again. President Bill is billing again. Hooray! President Bill. Well, unquestionably, the 19th century was an almost comically rule-bound age. This is what we lost in the First World War, says David Frum. The United States in World War One, the same mood of revulsion expressed itself as an omnidirectional cynicism. Well, I don't know. The Western hero is individualistic, unsettled, and violent when necessary, but not, Gary Wills notes, a thug. Now, in the New Yorker, we're talking about Europe here. As a word, Europe goes back a long way. Assyrian inscriptions speak of the difference between Asu, where the sun rises, i.e. Asia, and Arab, where it sets, Europe. The colossal efforts of Charlemagne, Louis XIV, and Napoleon, though they gave us, respectively, the restoration of learning, the apex of the comfortable arts, and the crucial new reality of the career open to the talents, all depended on military might. Hegel said that history was the story of liberty becoming conscious of itself. In the 20th century, history is the story of Europe becoming frightened of itself. Thank you for not being a communist, says Aldon Dandini in a cartoon. Did you know that North Korea was declared, was preparing for war back in April? Gee, but there hasn't been a war yet. Yet. Of course, they're all starving to death. I'd love to give a copy of Speaker Gingrich to every American family, says uh, the Deputy Press Secretary of the Speaker of the House, quoted in the Wall Street Journal. I'd like to give Newt Gingrich to every American family, too, but I don't know if we could chop him up to quite that fine. 49 out of 100 of the largest economic units are countries. 51 out of 100 of the large econo largest economic units are corporations. Just so you know, that's about as good a place as any to call a halt to these proceedings. Because after all, 
Men who dominate conversation have shorter life expectancy. I resent well-educated people exploiting irrational elements in our culture, and that's what Andrew Weil is doing, says Donald, Donald, Dr. Arnold Relman on the popular Dr. Andrew Weil. Well, hell, I resent well-educated pe well people exploiting irrational elements in our culture, but that's what the wrong hero is doing. Of course, attention-getting disorder is the modern dance of self-congratulation, according to Time magazine of May 12th. Well, Tony Blair is to Bill Clinton as Harold Wilson was to JFK, also according to Time magazine. See, they're still uh, resounding and reverberating with the aftermath of the British prime ministerial elections. What's so bad about taking money from China? I mean, the Republicans took money from China, right? Joe Kennedy II, trying to weather a just-published book that depicts him as a narcissistic bully, says Meg Carlson. When you look at the third generation of Kennedy men, speaking of Eclipse, to wrap up our presentation, what much of what remains of a once powerful dynasty is good teeth, good hair, and the best PR a trust fund can buy. Some of the boys grew up from being spoiled and bratty, belittling the help, once chasing the cook up a tree at Hickory Hill, into full-blown debauchery, driving fast, drinking hard, club-hopping like wild men. Most of this got spun by the family retainers into the playful hijinks of a raucous clan. But the escapades got seamier over the years, and the spinning harder. A joyride with Joe Kennedy II left a young woman paralyzed after an accident on Nantucket. Bobby Jr. was a, a pr pr arrested for possession of heroin. David died in a Florida hotel of cocaine, demoral, and mellowril. William Kennedy Smith was accused and acquitted of rape after a night out with Uncle Ted. Now there's a great title for a book for you. Like a recession, a scandal is best early in an election cycle. So, anyhow, the poor, poor Kennedys. I wouldn't like to be in their shoes. Well, actually, I wouldn't mind being in their shoes, but hey, we finally got some picture on this. That's swell. You know, it took an awful long time. Well, this, uh, this ends our episode of Eclipse featuring the wrong hero, of course. And, um, I certainly hope that you had a good time. I had a swell time. It was 